Hey guys, and welcome to the chapter 20 lecture, which is all about diseases of the gastrointestinal tract. Now, this one is going to be kind of a long lecture because there are a lot of different pathogens that can affect the gastrointestinal tract. Part of that is due to the fact that there's so many parts of the gastrointestinal tract. Now, I feel like this is one of my favorite chapters. I don't know why. Maybe it's because I think poop and vomit are funny. Um, or because I love helminths, and this is really the only system that we focus on our helminth pathogens, because although helminths can infect other body systems, um, they're not far, very common in Western developed countries, and this book and this class is really definitely focused on, you know, um, infections that are common in developed countries that you might actually have in um, like a hospital setting in North America. So as far as helminth pathogens go, really the only ones we see in America are those of the GI tract. And you know I love helminths and love talking about them, so I get real excited at that part of the chapter. So like I said, the gastrointestinal system has a lot of parts. It also has a lot of names. It can be called the GI tract or the alimentary canal, um, the gastrointestinal system. So I'll, you know, vacillate between those and use them interchangeably. So the gastro, the GI tract is all of these parts here on the right, um, all the basically all the tubes and parts that food actually passes through. So starting with the mouth, ending with the anus, anything that food actually passes through is part of the gastrointestinal system. But then we also have these accessory organs, mainly glands that make chemicals that get um, basically secreted into the gastrointestinal system. So the salivary glands, the pancreas, the liver, and gallbladder are all accessory organs. So we'll talk about infections of those things as well in this chapter. So lots of parts to be infected. Um, some of the oops, uh, defenses of the gastrointestinal system, of course, there are the uh, chemicals that are made. So there's lots of enzymes that are made, um, things to digest your food proteases, lipases, amylases that break down carbs and fats and proteins. And they will are there to digest those things in your food, but they can also digest them in bacterial like membranes and in virus particles, sometimes, not always. Um, the mucus that lines the entire gastrointestinal tract helps to trap potential pathogens. Um, there's also different uh, anti- or um, defensive proteins, antimicrobial proteins that are made that are not enzymes per se necessarily, but help to prevent, ba neutralize bacteria or, or destroy them. So lysozyme, which breaks down bacterial cell walls, and IgA, secreted antibodies, that help to neutralize bacteria or viruses. Um, even the physical movement of the gastrointestinal system, you're, it, there's that sort of constant flushing and movement of things out that helps to keep bacteria from being able to sort of settle and colonize. And of course, the stomach acid in the stomach is a very low pH, very caustic, and kills most things that come into the stomach. But of course, we know we still get gastrointestinal infections, so it obviously doesn't kill everything. We also have, because there's so many microbes in the gut, like as commensals, we have a lot of lymphoid tissue there as well. And because the gut is so open and exposed to the external world, you're constantly putting things in your mouth when you eat, when you like lick your finger to turn a page. I think we're all right now during COVID being a little more um, careful about uh, our hands and the cleanliness of our hands before we put things in our mouth. Um, but certainly that is a very prominent portal of entry. And so it makes sense that we would have extra white blood cells sort of distributed throughout the gastrointestinal tract and that's what the GALT is. It's gut associated lymphoid tissue, little patches that are basically jam-packed with extra B cells and T cells and phagocytes. Um, so some examples of those, your tonsils and adenoids in your neck, the Peyer's patches surrounding the small intestine, the appendix which sticks off the first part of the large intestine, and then, of course, we have all of our happy, lovely commensal microbes, which provide that microbial antagonism and defend their territory against potential pathogens. So we have a bunch of good microbes that we want to keep around. And those good microbes are distributed 
roughly as follows. So there's some, but very few in the stomach, because I remember again, the stomach is very acidic. So the only bacteria that survive there are acidophiles, ones that actually like that stomach acid environment. So there's really not that many different species, maybe a hundred or a thousand different types of microbes that can live in the stomach. But as we progress down through the small intestine and the large intestine, we get increasing numbers of species of microbes, where in the large intestine we have, what is that, a billion to a trillion different species of normal gut flora. And these normal microbes have multiple purposes. They do help with digestion to some extent, particularly those in the colon, help us digest things called soluble fibers. We don't have enzymes to, like our body doesn't produce enzymes to digest soluble fiber, but our gut bacteria can. And in the process of doing that, they produce chemicals that actually promote gut health and promote overall health. So soluble fiber is very good for you because it's very good for your gut bacteria. It also helps us to make nutrients. It provides certain vitamins for us. Vitamin K, we get pretty much entirely from our gut microbes. So um, it's very rare for someone to have a vitamin K deficiency. The exception is newborns. When you're first born, you are sterile. You don't start getting colonized until after you come out of the birth canal. So for those first, you know, the first week of life or so, um, infants can be vitamin K deficient because they may not have the microbes producing enough vitamin K yet. And vitamin K is very important for blood clotting. And so if you can't, if you don't have enough vitamin K, your blood is very thin, essentially, and you can get hemorrhaging or leaking of blood through the blood vessels. And so vitamin K shots, there's a vitamin K shot that's given to newborns at birth. It's sort of standard procedure to give them that sort of like initial amount of vitamin K, like basically a single dose of vitamin K to last them for that first, you know, couple of weeks until their, until their, their uh, gastrointestinal system is colonized and their bacteria are making enough vitamin K to prevent fatal bleeding disorders. Um, prop, they also help, the, so the, they help with proper functioning of the epithelial cell structures. So that's what I was saying with the soluble fiber. They digest soluble fiber and then actually produce chemicals that make the intestines healthier. But so a lot of these things were the hypotheses of scientists as to why we had gut microbes. Oh, they must be providing some service, beneficial service, like they help us digest things or they help make um, vitamins, which they do. But it turns out that probably one of the most important roles of our gut microbes is actually in helping to train the immune system. And they've done studies in mice where they've taken mice and, and when they were born, they basically were born in a, they were cut out like C-section and then kept in a totally sterile environment so that they didn't get colonized with bacteria at all. And basically all of the mice develop inflammatory bowel syndromes um, and other autoimmune diseases. That, that without those gut microbes colonizing the intestinal tract, the immune system doesn't develop properly and then actually starts attacking the body itself. So, and that's like the biggest problem they have. It's not that they can't digest things, food properly, or that they're vitamin deficient. The biggest problem they have is these autoimmune diseases. So it turns out gut microbes are really, really important for our immune system and training it properly. Um, there's also a lot of evidence, similar studies in mice, that have shown that the populations of gut microbes, depending on which populations you have, can determine whether a mouse is obese or normal weight. So your body weight may be more influenced by your gut microbes than by your genetics or by the diet that you eat, though it's kind of hard to separate because your genetics and your diet can influence your gut microbes. But one day we might have a diet pill that's basically just a probiotic. Um, all right, so now let's start talking about diseases. Um, the first disease that we're going to talk about is the disease itself is acute diarrhea. And so, of course, diarrhea is watery stools. And acute means that it sort of, you know, comes on quickly and is usually somewhat short-lived. Um, so we're talking about, like, intense, you have diarrhea a lot for a short period of time. The definition of it is three or more loose stools in a 24-hour period. 
It's often accompanied by other symptoms like fever, abdominal cramping, maybe also have vomiting with it, but might not. And one of the um, consequences of diarrhea, the dangerous, most dangerous consequence of diarrhea is, is dehydration. You lose a lot of water. And um, if you can't replace it, then your body becomes dehydrated. Your blood volume decreases, your blood pressure decreases, you have trouble oxygenating things. You need water. Um, your cells need water. So diarrhea, very, very common. The average U.S. citizen experiences one to two cases per year. So likelihood is that everyone in this class has experienced diarrhea at some point in the last year, but if not, at least in their lifetime. Um, it's usually transmitted by contaminated food or water. Most, pretty much all of the diseases in this chapter that we'll talk about are transmitted through the fecal oral route of transmission, basically consuming something that's been contaminated with feces. Sounds gross, but it is what it is. Um, some, a lot of times diarrhea is self-limiting, gets better, you know, you have it for 24, 48 hours and it gets better on its own. Your immune system, your gastrointestinal system basically flushes out the pathogen and it's fine. The biggest danger is usually that dehydration, becoming dangerously dehydrated, but there are some pathogens that we'll talk about that can cause additional damage to the gastrointestinal system and may need further treatment. Um, Although it's really common and often mild in developed countries, it's often a big killer in undeveloped countries, different diarrheal diseases. Again, because of that dehydration that can occur and also because there may be more access to contaminated food. So they may continue to um, ingest that the source of that pathogen, which makes it harder for them to get rid of it because they basically keep reinfecting themselves and then they can become severely dehydrated and, um, and die. So acute diarrhea, another interesting thing, sort of overall thing that I'll say about acute diarrhea is that the treatment of it is not necessarily what you would think. So even though there's a lot of these are caused by bacteria, a lot of times they are not treated with antimicrobials because in the gastrointestinal system, if you take an antibiotic, you're going to kill a lot of your good bacteria and may or may not kill those. But even if you do kill those bad bacteria, you're making more room you're, by killing off the good microbes. You're getting rid of that antimicrobial um, uh, antagonism. And so you really need those good microbes to help you fight off the pathogen. So antimicrobials, antibiotics are usually a, a sort of last resort for diarrheal infections, even if they're bacterial, because um, your good microbes actually help a lot in that fight. So usually the main course of treatment for acute diarrhea is just to treat the dehydration, make sure the patient stays hydrated, and then they their bodies will basically be able to take care of the pathogen. Not in all situations, and we'll talk about some, but that is oftentimes, that's the first, the first course of treatment. Um, this is just a chart showing you the sort of severity of different um, common causes of diarrhea, salmonella, norovirus, campylobacter, toxoplasma, and E. coli are all organisms that can cause diarrhea. Um, salmonella tends to cause the most hospitalizations it can cause the most sort of severe diarrhea. There are some strains of E. coli that can cause really severe disease. And um, usually actually it's not the diarrhea, it's it can cause kidney disease, which is really bad. Norovirus is like the, this is a, a viral cause of di uh, diarrhea and it's super common and super contagious. And it tends to result in hospitalizations for either very young or very old individuals. And again, it's mostly from that dehydration. All right, so let's start with salmonella. So salmonella is a genus of bacteria. So there's different species of salmonella. There's salmonella, in, or, uh, salmonella enterica, I guess, is the species. And there's different sort of subtypes. So there are subspecies. And one of the subspecies is Salmonera, Salmonella um, typhi. And the typhi variant is the one that caused typhoid fever, which barely exists anymore. 
um, but used to be much more problematic. So you can see in this graph here, typhoid fever was really bad in like the 40s and 50s and then tapered off and we really don't have any cases hardly ever anymore, at least not in developed countries. Um, and uh, But we still get a lot of salmonellosis of people getting salmonella infections from other other strains or subtypes of salmonella. So it's still very prevalent, um, just this, this strain is different. So I've told you guys the story before of typhoid Mary. She was a carrier of salmonella typhi, of the typhoid variant. Uh, she just carried it in her intestines. It didn't cause her any disease or diarrhea, but she maybe didn't wash her hands before preparing food and prepared a lot of food with her hands and served it to people. She was a cook and everywhere she went, there were these typhoid outbreaks and they ended up basically arresting her and imprisoning her to keep her, keep the public safe but then they finally decided that really wasn't, I don't know, constitutional or legal. So they ended up letting her go, but made her promise not to work in the food industry anymore. And then she did, and more cases of typhoid. She just really didn't understand. Again, this was like in the 19, oh, I don't remember what era it was. Maybe in the 1920s. I can't read that paper, the date on the paper, but it was, um, you know, she was, she was uneducated. She, I'm not even sure she could read. And she definitely did not understand the concept of being a carrier of a disease that she didn't have. How could she, how could she be giving people a disease that she didn't have? That was very, a very foreign concept and still is to a lot of people. We're still seeing that right now with this, um, with the coronavirus pandemic. People have this misconception that if they are healthy and they haven't been sick, then they can't transmit disease. They don't understand this concept of being a carrier, having a carrier status, being asymptomatic. And so um, she, she really struggled to understand how she was a risk to public health. So um, salmonella um, is really a normal flora in a lot of animals, in cattle, in poultry, things that we eat, animals that we eat. And so those are the foods that are most likely contaminated, ones that are from um, like undercooked beef or poultry. Also reptiles are a normal carrier, so people can get it from their pets as well. So salmonella has a fairly high infectious dose. So if you, if you have contaminated meat but it's cooked properly, you're gonna kill the salmonella. Um, in adults, a lot of times the disease is mild. It's in people who are immunocompromised or are very young or very old where the disease can be very serious and life-threatening and require hospitalization. Um, it's going to be found most likely in undercooked poultry, um, in dairy products that are unpasteurized, and also it can be found in eggs used to be just the surface of the egg was the source of the salmonella. So just that's why they, they wash and bleach eggs. Um, but now it can also be found inside the eggs. There are strains of salmonella that have basically adapted to grow inside the ovary. of The chicken doesn't make them sick, but does contaminate their eggs, but it's pretty few. It's like one in 2000 eggs might test positive for salmonella. Um, Unfortunately, in the food system, because of the way we, we produce food and manufacture food on a massive scale in these massive batches, um, we've seen more and more outbreaks of foodborne illness and, and really massive outbreaks of foodborne illness with things like salmonella in the past couple of decades. So some sort of unexpected products that have tested positive, peanut butter, there have been two major peanut salmonella outbreaks. And one of them was in a peanut processing facility where there was like a hole in the roof and it was leaking water from the roof. And there were like, you know, pigeons and birds that pooped on the roof. So this water was dropping onto one of the machines and contaminating the peanuts. And it was like this tiny little leak that they, they didn't find until it was too late, um, until they basically did these investigations after this massive outbreak. So you would not think, you know, normally you'd think, well, how the hell are peanuts getting contaminated with salmonella if salmonella comes from 
bird poop and cow poop, um, it that was how it got contaminated. So um, a lot of produce can also become contaminated through watering and um, manure. If the manure comes from animal feces, which is very common, especially cattle, um, it can it can have salmonella in it or, you know, birds that carry salmonella, poop all over produce, whatever. So it, really nothing is totally safe. Um, but because of these food at borne outbreaks that we've had over the last couple of decades, food safety testing has been increased. So pretty much all food producers have to test produce, whatever, for these different organisms. And, um, and that helps to keep us safe. And then when there's an outbreak, the CDC comes in and they track down what it is and they recall all potentially contaminated foods. Okay, so in this family of gram-negative rods that cause gastrointestinal disease, we've got Salmonella, Shigella, and E. coli. And that's the first family we're talking about here. So Shigella is very much related to Salmonella. It's very similar bacteria. But it is a primarily human parasite or path like a uh, organism. So where we saw with Shigella and we'll see E. coli as well can be found in, as a normal flora in a lot of animal intestines. That's not the case with Shigella. So sh if you get Shigella, usually it's because you're getting it from another person who didn't wash their hands and then prepared your food or touched you and then you touched your mouth. So um, Shigella, one of the things it can do, it produces some, some toxins that are particularly toxic to the intestines and cause a lot of damage. So two of those toxins, it, it um, produces enterotoxin, which damages the GI tract and can cause fever. And it also produces something called shigatoxin, which is because it's Shigella, so they called it shigatoxin. Um, and that causes even more severe damage to the intestines. And so this is a normal, healthy intestine, and this is one with severe damage from bacterial toxins like shigatoxin. And so anytime you have diarrhea and intestinal damage like that, we call the disease dysentery. So dysentery, it literally means like abnormal, painful intestines. So there's a lot of cramping and pain, usually bloody stools, if not um, red blood, like dried blood, which we call occult blood. Um, and that's a sign of dysentery. And dysentery can be caused by Shigella, can also be caused by E. coli and some other microbes. So dysentery is not like a specific disease to Shigella. It just is an overall term for an, an infection of the intestines that causes intestinal damage and bleeding. Um, all right, so of course we get Shigella from other people. It has a smaller infectious dose than Salmonella. So if you come into contact with someone who has it is a carrier, you're more likely to get it. Again, just like Salmonella, there are people out there who are asymptomatic carriers, don't have the disease, so it's not like they came to work with diarrhea and were preparing your food. They didn't have any disease and they prepared your food and then and you got it. So really for all of these gastrointestinal infections, a very like standard form of prevention is good hygiene, hand washing before preparing food, hand washing before eating food and also um, good cooking practices. So of course, all of these bacteria are susceptible to death by heating. So if you cook your food to the proper temperatures, then you kill any bacteria. So even if the food is contaminated, you kill that contamination so you don't get sick. Um, and then the third gram negative rod in that family is E. coli. So remember E. coli, a lot of strains of E. coli are totally harmless. The strains we work with in lab, um, there's plenty of E. coli in your intestines that are perfectly healthy, normal commensal bacteria. But there are a couple of strains of E. coli that have basically been um, infected with a um, bacteriophage that transferred toxin genes to it and they became transformed by those uh, um, bacteriophages and now produce toxins. So one of the most important strains of bacteria, the, so really the first one on the scene that caused really bad disease is called E. coli 0157H7. 
or reference that O, ref, the O and the H are proteins on the surface of the bacteria that, and so that's how we categorize it. Kind of like with flu, we have H1N1 and H5N9. So same thing with E. coli, we've got the O and H antigens that we can label them by. So E. coli 0157H7 came onto the scene in the 1990s in a big outbreak that was at Jack in the Box, which is a fast food chain that I've actually, don't think I've ever seen one. I don't know where, I think they're in like maybe the Midwest or something. Um, but they weren't in Georgia or in Philadelphia or New York or the cities I've lived in in my life. But it's basically like a McDonald's or a Burger King or a Crystal. And um, they had a big outbreak in their hamburgers. And a couple people died. Kids, actually. Well, at least one was a kid. And, um, and that's a strain that has entered circulation. They think it evolved in cow guts. Um, when we change the diet of cattle. So cows eat grass, that's sort of their normal diet. But when we grow cows in these large sort of farm facilities for mass meat production, they're often fed in troughs with lots of corn because we have an abundance of corn. Corn is a subsidized grain. And so we use it to feed a lot of our um, agricultural animals, meat animals. and Cows are not actually adapted to eat corn. And so when they went from eating grass to eating corn, that changed their gut microbes. And um, this E. coli strain ended up evolving. So it's possible that we kind of brought it onto the scene with how we produce animals. But also it gets into the food because of how we manufacture meat and how we just um, basically take massive numbers of cows and send them all to like, there's only a handful of slaughtering houses in the U.S. There used to be many because you would have, everyone basically ate local meat. Um, there were farms all over and slaughterhouses all over, but now we mass produce meat on these farms and they, they basically have these giant slaughterhouse facilities where many farms will send their cattle to. And then like when you make ground beef at these facilities, it's like thousands of cows, meat from thousands of cows going into this big meat grinder and grinding up all this meat. And so if one little piece of cow intestine or fecal matter gets into that giant grinder, then all of the meat becomes contaminated. And so that's why we end up with these giant like um, recalls of ground beef where like millions of pounds are being recalled because they were all made together in the same vat and so they they all become at risk so foodborne illness is not new it has always sort of been out there but we do have evolution of new pathogens because of the way that we now produce meat and raise cattle and and poultry in these massive facilities and produce meat en masse, we can, we can spread the foodborne illness much more quickly and much more broadly than we ever used to. It used to just be that foodborne illness would be like, you know, these little local outbreaks. But now we'll have nationwide outbreaks. So in 2011, there was a scary outbreak of E. coli, a new strain of E. coli that's called O104H4, that's even more pathogenic than O157H7. It caused even worse disease. And it was an outbreak in Germany, and it was, it was actually due to sprouts, contaminated sprouts, like alfalfa sprouts. So not even a meat. It was contaminated through like the irrigation process. Um, and so 852 cases, 32 deaths. Most of these people were hospitalized. It, the, so the problem with these shiga toxin producing E. coli strains is they produce that shiga toxin so they can cause dysentery, a really bad inflammation of the intestines, but they can also cause infection of the kidneys that I'll get to in a second. So again, transmission, of course, is through uh, the fecal oral route. Um, this is very dated. Current is, or okay, I guess this was last year's dates. Um, there was an outbreak of this new strain or of, a, of a new strain, an O103 outbreak in a few states in the U.S. 
that they think ground beef was the culprit. So there's always sort of these new strains of shiga toxin producing E. coli that just, you know, they keep changing, having going through genetic drift and just having slight changes in their antigens that make them new and and cause new disease. So the um, virulence, the main virulence from this strain of E. coli is due to that acquisition of that shiga toxin. So vanilla E. coli in your intestines that's healthy for you doesn't produce toxins, but the pathogenic strains do. And one of the really bad, so they can cause, you know, really a lot of damage to the intestines and bleeding, and that could cause like perforation of the intestines. That alone can be very dangerous. But what is usually deadly in this disease is it can cause what's known as hemolytic uremic syndrome, where basically it causes kidney damage and, um, and the kidneys start to fail. And if you can't get the kidneys to recover, then the patient dies. And this is usually what results in death from, from STEC, from shiga toxin producing E. coli, is if they develop that hemolytic uremic syndrome. Um, a very common cause, actually the most common cause of bacterial diarrhea in this country is actually an organism called Campylobacter, which you may not have even heard of. Um, it's considering that it's the most common cause, you'd think you'd heard of it more, but you don't. So you can get it from, again, ingesting contaminated food or water. It can actually infect the cells of the small intestine and cause damage to them that way. So you can get some blood in the stool. Um, and it is one infection where they will sometimes treat it with antibiotics. Antibiotics can be effective if it's a very severe case. But I think a lot of the cases are fairly mild. So they're ones that are self-limiting. People suffer from at home and it goes away. Um, one thing, though, that's interesting about Campylobacter is that it is one of the more common causes of this sequelae known as Guillain-Barre syndrome or GBS. Now, Guillain-Barre syndrome, I think, gets a lot of press because another thing that can, can lead to Guillain-Barre syndrome is flu. And flu vaccines, certain vaccines, can have this very rare side effect of this sort of temporary paralysis syndrome. It's called Guillain-Barre syndrome. And it causes paralysis, but it usually goes away. I mean, after several months, but it's you do actually recover from it. Um, but most, the most common, so it's really not very well understood what causes Guillain-Barre syndrome. We know that it can, it commonly follows infections um, with viruses or bacteria, or sometimes it can be a side effect of a vaccine because you're injecting virus or bacteria antigens. But they still really don't know the mechanism of what causes it. And, but they do know that the most common cause of it seems to be uh, Campylobacter. 20 to 40 percent of GBS cases are preceded by an infection with Campylobacter. So it's very strange, but maybe something to look out for after you have a really bad stomach bug and diarrhea. Um, all right, so those are some really common foodborne illnesses. A new, another one that's sort of separate that also still causes, we're still talking about acute diarrhea here, is Clostridium difficile. Now, Clostridium difficile causes particularly severe diarrhea and is particularly difficult to treat because it is a normal flora and a lot of the infections are due to super infection, meaning it's normal bacteria that you're asymptomatic and then maybe you take antibiotics and you kill a lot of your normal microbes and then the Clostridium difficile overgrows. So antibiotic treatment is actually something that causes Clostridium difficile infections. Um, and But also there are antibiotics that can be used to treat it. So it's kind of counterintuitive that way. The problem is a lot of Clostridium can be resistant to antibiotics, 
in part because the antibiotics are killing other microbes that would help to be protective. So it's kind of this double-edged sword. Um, it's a big problem in hospitals and nursing homes where you have a lot of people on antibiotics. So antibiotic treatment is a major precursor for C. diff, Clostridium difficile infections. And there's something like 500,000 cases a year in the US and 15,000 deaths per year. And that number is on the rise. Um, it's becoming more and more problematic as we use more and more antibiotics and as we have more and more antibiotic resistant organisms, which oftentimes ends up in just throwing stronger, higher doses of antibiotics at people, which then leads downstream to C. diff. So um, the treatment for C. diff, there are antibiotics that can be used, but they've recently done research with fecal microbiota transplants or FMT, which we've talked about before, where they basically take healthy or normal microbes from a healthy person's intestines and, um, and transplant them into a diseased person's intestines. So this is just a cool diagram of the process of C. diff infection. So you have someone healthy, you give them antibiotics, it kills a lot of those healthy microbiota, and then C. diff um, that's already there in their intestines can sporulate and cause infection. And C. diff is a clostridium. Other clostridium that we've talked about are clostridium tetani and clostridium botulinum which cause tetanus and botulism. And if you remember, they are endospore formers. All clostridium genus bacteria are endospore formers. And so they can form these endospores that just sit around in your intestines and do nothing until the conditions are right for them to sporulate or germ germinate and actually cause, like grow uh, metabolically. And so the other thing is that you can constantly be reinfected by these spores. And these spores are hard to kill in healthcare environments. So it's harder to sterilize a room and really get rid of all those C. diff spores. Um, and people can carry them and passively transfer them from one patient to another. And so um, you can get these recurrent infections. And that's really common with C. diff to have these recurrent infections. And so fecal microbiota transplantation, it's really FDA approved for people with recurrent infections. So if you have and the first time you have an infection with C. diff, you'll probably be treated with antibiotics. Um, but if you have recurrent infections, then they'll go to this, the FMT, the fecal microbiota transplant, which is basically a poop transfer. They take poop from someone who doesn't have C. diff, and they basically like process the poop. Now I think they'll actually process it into pills that you just swallow. But they used to initially actually like spray it as a spray inside the rectum using a colonos like colonoscopy tools. Um, but it had such good success rates that during the clinical trials where they were testing this procedure, they actually, so they had one group of people who were getting the fecal transplants and one group of people that were getting antibiotic therapy. And the fecal transplants were doing so well and improving so much that they actually decided it was like unethical to continue the study because the placebo group or the group that was getting the regular treatment they were doing so poorly, it was unethical not to give them the fecal transplant. So then they ended up giving everyone the fecal transplants. So it's a really effective um, treatment therapy, but it still needs further testing and development because they still have had situations where people, um, they didn't test thoroughly enough. They didn't test the, the healthy donor well enough and accidentally transferred a virus or something to the recipient and then the recipient um, perished. So they do still, there's, it's what's, um, I guess, kind of dangerous about it is there's so many microbes that you're transferring over. So it's kind of, it's not defined. It's not a defined um, substance like a drug that's been purified to be just this one chemical. There's, you know, thousands, millions of chemicals and and microbes that you're transferring. So they really have to figure out, make sure that they're screening it for any potential pathogens before implanting it into someone else. So there's that inherent danger. Um, I suppose another danger of, of FMT is that it's so simple 
just transferring one person's poop into another person's poop is there's the danger of people doing it themselves at home. There's actually websites dedicated to teaching you how to like basically get an enema bag at the, you know, the pharmacy and like taking your partner or a friend or family member's poop and putting it in the enema bag and then sticking the enema up your butt and transferring the fecal, you know, doing your own at home fecal microbiota transplants, which are dangerous because if you don't test the other person's stool, you never know what transmissible diseases they might have that you're putting in your body. So there's that danger too. But otherwise, it seems to be an incredibly effective treatment for C. diff especially for recurrent C. diff because you're just repopulating the person's gut with those healthy microbes they need to fight off the C. diff without killing sort of the opposite of using antibiotics. All right, um, cholera is a really important diarrhea pathogen that is very uncommon in the U.S. and developed countries. So cholera is different than a lot of these other microbes that we talked about because the other microbes that we've talked about so far all have the um, normal environment of the gut. So E. coli and salmonella, they colonize animal guts, the animals that we eat, poultry, chickens, cattle. Um, Shigella, normal inhabitant of a lot of human guts, just doesn't always make people sick. And what was the last one I talked about? Clostr Clostridium is also a normal flora for a lot of people. So you can have a lot of asymptomatic carriers. Cholera, Vibrio cholera, the organism, is actually an environmental microbe. So it lives in water. And it does always cause disease, basically, when it gets into a human. That's not its normal environment. But it can turn on a whole different set of genes when it enters the human that allow it to colonize and then produce toxins that cause disease. So um, there's a couple of different subtypes of Vibrio that cause different levels of severity of disease, but it was really a devastating disease for many centuries when people didn't, there was no water treatment. People would just, you know, put a pipe in the ground to a natural, you know, water source or in, you know, drink out of rivers or, um, and, and cholera could contaminate those water sources and then spread in communities that use those water sources. Um, and the water could become contaminated after, it was very common for it to become contaminated after natural disasters, like big storms that just wash, you know, mix different water sources. So um, we still get a lot of outbreaks of cholera around the world in countries where they don't necessarily treat their water. They just drink out of you know, natural water sources, um, especially if it's after a natural disaster. And so it still affects millions of people around the world, just not so much in the U.S. But it can be a cause for concern when you travel. It can be a form of traveler's diarrhea. So it forms a particularly severe form of diarrhea. So uh, you get some vomiting, and the, I underline the word copious here, copious diarrhea. It's often called rice water stool because it's wa it's it's white. It's kind of like mucusy. You get a lot of mucusy diarrhea. Um, and the so in a lot of like old school cholera treatment facilities, they would have these beds with basically they didn't have bed pants. They would just have like a hole cut out where the butt was for the patient to just basically because they're basically just it's just constant, like it's really severe diarrhea and they basically just die of dehydration because they can lose up to 50% of their body weight um, in a couple of days from just basically just peeing out of their butts. And, um, and it can send the body into shock because you lose so much fluid, a lot of that fluid comes from the blood, so you get really low blood pressure and then you can't circulate your blood very well and you uh, start um, being oxygen deprived and showing cyanosis or bluing of the skin. So death can occur very quickly. Um, the mortality rate can be very high, basically from just massive amounts of fluid loss very quickly. And so the treat, uh, the pathogenesis of this, the, the toxin that cholera makes that makes you lose water so quickly is um, a protein that uh, disrupts 
um, ion transfer in the gut. And so it causes basically all of these ions to flow into the lumen of the intestine. And those ions attract water into the intestine. This is in French for some reason. So the red is the water, the blue is the ions. So the ions, it, it um, basically produces this ion channel that pokes, pokes holes in membranes and causes ions to flow into the intestines, which then attracts all this water into the intestines. So it causes all these electrolyte imbalances. All right, so the key for treatment is really to rehydrate people, make sure that they get electrolytes and fluids to replace the electrolytes and fluids that are massively flowing out of their system so quickly. So the main treatment is not antibiotics, though antibiotics can be given, but a lot of times in countries where cholera is endemic, they don't have the healthcare facilities, they don't have access to antibiotics that they could use. And so the like World Health Organization and UNICEF and um, other countries that really try to get to undeveloped, you know, outbreaks. Um, the main treatment is this is this rehydration therapy, which they can do through IV, but you can also do it orally through basically like a Gatorade powdered mixture that they can get to countries easily. And you just um, have to make sure, of course, to use sterile water. So education is key, teaching people how to treat their water, to boil it before drinking it or cooking with it, um, or giving them some kind of water purification tools and giving them these powdered oral rehydration therapy, basically like Gatorade, to replenish fluids and electrolytes until they recover. Um, it's really brought mortality rates down significantly. So it doesn't prevent the cholera, but it really helps to reduce the number of deaths. So um, there are some vaccines, but they only give very short-term immunity and they're really not routinely used in the US, even amongst travelers, unless you're like going into like an active cholera outbreak, you're like a healthcare worker, then they might give it to you. But um, even in case of travelers, they will just tell you to use safe drinking practices in other countries. So um, another organism, now we're gonna talk about some protozoa that can cause diarrhea. As we go up from, so like bacteria cause pretty bad disease, um, protozoans tend to cause more chronic diarrhea, more than acute diarrhea. But um, cryptosporidium can cause a particularly severe form of diarrhea. It's a protozoan. It can get into water. It's normally found in like, you know, untreated water sources, but can sometimes get through into water treatment facilities and contaminate even treated water. Um, and it gets in, you drink it, and it goes through a sort of molting stage where you, what you swallow is the oocyst, and then the oocyst sort of hatches in the gut and infects the gut cells, and then you poop it out, and it continues its life cycle in the environment. Um, so it can, it's often associated with swimming pools. So one of the things about crypto is it's very resistant to chlorine. And chlorine is used to um, sterilize water pools, or swimming pools. And so, but since it's fairly resistant, people who get diarrhea from swimming pools, when there's outbreaks from a swimming pool, it's usually from cryptosporidium, simply because it can resist that chlorine. Other times it's from, um, you know, swimmers who had diarrhea from salmonella or E. coli, something like that, who contaminated the pool. Um, chlorination is pretty effective at killing those bacteria, but not in large amounts. Um, so uh, another thing is that it is usually self-limiting in people who are healthy and develop this disease, but it is deadly in people who have immunodeficiencies, particularly those with AIDS. There was a really deadly outbreak in Minnesota, I think in the 1990s, 80s or 90s, where a filtration system that was used by the water treatment facility in Minnesota and Minneapolis failed to um, filter out the cryptosporidium and it devastated the AIDS can people, um, with, like basically everyone who had AIDS died the, that year of cryptosporidium. Um, 
it caused just a really deadly infection for them. All right, now on to some viruses that can cause acute diarrhea. Rotavirus used to be the primary cause of disease and death in from diarrhea worldwide, but particularly in really young um, children and infants. And so I think it was in 2006 that the rotavirus vaccine came out and now it's very typical. It's part of the um, vaccination schedule in kids. And the nice thing is, is it's an oral vaccine. So it's just given by mouth. It's a liquid that they drink, which makes sense to design an oral vaccine for a virus that has an oral route of transmission. Um, and so the, of course, babies are at the greatest risk of the disease, which is why they are the ones who get the vaccine. Um, after infancy, it's much less of a, of a risk. So I think after five years old, like if somebody didn't vaccinate their child and then their child was going into the school system when they were six, then um, they wouldn't need the rotavirus vaccine. It's really only approved for infants and children under five because that's when the mortality from the disease is highest. So it's also, it's another reason to get your kids vaccinated because um, the immunity to the vaccine is very long lasting, but it's not approved beyond five years of age. So kids after five can't get the vaccine, but they can still get the virus. So, um, it tends to be less dangerous though at that point, but still not fun if you've ever had diarrhea and vomiting, super not fun. Um, so at least we have, it's one, one of the, it's one of the few gastrointestinal diseases that we actually have a vaccine for and is preventative. It would be really great if we could get a vaccine for norovirus because norovirus is the most common cause of acute gastroenteritis, which usually results in a lot of vomiting and maybe also some diarrhea. Um, so it's often you see outbreaks of it in closed environments like prisons and dorms and cruise ships are sort of famous. It's sometimes called like the cruise ship virus because it's very contagious. So if it shows up in a closed space, everyone, you know, everyone gets it. So you, um, it, even though cruise ships are very sort of small percentage of norovirus outbreaks, they, they tend to be ones that are reported in the media and sort of famous. Um, but you can also get them, the really main place where they break out is in these long-term care facilities because those are also people who are, you know, somewhat immunocompromised. And so it spreads very quickly in that, that closed facility amongst people that are immunocompromised. It's also most dangerous in elderly and in infants. Elderly people tend to have less fluid, body fluid, just by nature of their age and their um, like sort of muscle and body um, tissues. And so, and dehydration is much more dangerous for them as well. And of course, with these acute diarrhea and vomiting diseases, the biggest problem is that dehydration. And so that's the thing with norovirus. Another condition from microbes that can cause diarrhea and vomiting is food poisoning. Now, food poisoning is not so much from an infection. It's not the microbe replicating. It's a toxin that they produce that causes the vomiting and diarrhea. And so food poisoning is usually very short-lived because it takes, and it comes on very quickly. So it doesn't require an incubation period for microbes to like grow and reproduce. They, the microbes get in and start producing that toxin and you react violently to that toxin pretty quickly. So the two most common bacteria that cause food poisoning are Staphylococcus aureus, just that bacteria that can basically cause disease anywhere and everywhere in the body, and Bacillus cereus. They both produce toxins that cause vomiting and diarrhea. And so these are, um, if you have sort of like a 24 hour stomach bug, um, it could be norovirus, especially if other people in your household get it, um, or it could be from food poisoning, especially if you ate something that was potential for food poisoning. Um, recovery is pretty rapid and you always get better on your own, 
sometimes some people, especially if their hydration status is already questionable, may become really dehydrated and need, you know, um, like hospitalization for IV fluids. Um, but the key is in these cases of food poisoning, a single source, like a single food item is what is linking all of the cases. So food poisoning is not transmissible from person to person. So <clears throat> I succumbed to food poisoning a couple of months ago. At least that's me self-diagnosing it. Um, and so this is one of the common ways that it happens with Staph aureus. So you make a casserole or like, you know, potato salad and you go to a picnic and everyone's taking, you know, food from that dish. And so maybe somebody is a carrier of Staph aureus and some Staph aureus gets onto the food and it sits out for a couple of hours. So the Staph aureus is growing and then, and it's producing this toxin. Okay. And then you put away the leftovers in the refrigerator, the bacteria stops growing, but there's still toxin there. And so even if you heat up the food afterwards, the toxin is not killed by the heat. The bacteria are. So maybe the Staph aureus doesn't, doesn't cause infection. It's not actually replicating in your intestines, but it has produced toxin that's now contaminated the food. And when you eat the food, you get sick. And so I think this happened to me with like a, like an egg, like a casserole souffle quiche that I made a couple months ago with like broccoli and ham and cheese and eggs. And it was really yummy and I made it and we all ate it. And then I put it away and it probably sat out for a little while. And then I put away the leftovers in the fridge and a couple days later, I came home from work and I had some leftovers for my dinner, but nobody else ate it. It was just me. And then the next day I just was like vomiting like crazy, like just, everything was coming up and I was so confused. I thought maybe it was norovirus because I thought that was the most common cause, but I realized nobody else in the house was sick and nobody else in the house got sick over the next couple of days. So nobody caught it from me. And my husband and my daughter were in very close proximity. We share, you know, food and drink. So if I had something contagious, they would have gotten it. So then I started, you know, thinking about the things I had eaten and that leftover quiche came into mind and I was like, I bet that was it. I bet I let it sit out too late and too long and the leftovers were contaminated and I was the only one who ate them that night. So that's how I determined it was food poisoning. And of course I threw out whatever other leftovers of that quiche I had in the fridge. I didn't touch it, but it's also a good, um, I guess, PSA for making sure you're, you are, um, good about food safety, like put away leftovers quickly and don't like have lots of people touching them, you know, use clean utensils, wash your hands before you serve food, before you eat food, because likely me or my husband or child were the ones that contaminated the quiche in the first place with that staph aureus that made me sick. So um, another bacteria that produces a toxin that makes you sick is Bacillus cereus. And the Bacillus cereus toxin is definitely an emetic and it causes a lot of vomiting. So perhaps that is actually what I contaminated myself with. I don't know, I didn't test the quiche. Um, but it definitely results in more vomiting than in diarrhea. And so emetic is just a term for something that causes a lot of vomiting. Um, a fun story for you with Bacillus cereus. So again, these, these food poisoning is usually very unpleasant, but it's usually very self-limiting and not deadly. But there was a case of deadly Bacillus cereus food poisoning um, recently that was like in the media, or at least in social media in maybe 2019. Um, it was a guy who, you know, it's very trendy to like prep your meals for the week. So like, you know, he cooked a bunch of spaghetti at the beginning of the week, and then he portioned it out to have some each day of the week. But he didn't refrigerate it. It was like spaghetti with tomato sauce, but he didn't refrigerate it. So he was leaving these like tubs of spaghetti and tomato sauce out, like at room temperature on his countertop. And like the third or fourth day, he was eating a serving and he said it tasted kind of funny. 
and he had like severe vomiting and then he went to bed. And I don't know, I guess he was just very dehydrated or something and it caused electrolyte imbalance that he like had a heart attack in his sleep, but he actually died. And they found him dead in his apartment and then they found this, these pasta that was totally contaminated with Bacillus cereus because he didn't refrigerate it. So refrigerate your leftovers is the other thing. Um, another one that can cause, that can pr produce a toxin is called Clostridium perfring perfringes. And you can find this sometimes in um, foods that haven't been fully cooked. Um, it's also the cause of gas gangrene. So this is a bacteria that can get into wounds and cause um, gangrene or infection of wounds but it can also potentially get into food and cause diarrhea. Um, death from it in the fecal, in the sort of foodborne illness is very rare. Death from gangrene or infection of a wound is more common. So um, it's not one we, we hear a lot about, but it can be a cause of food poisoning. All right, so um, I guess the, another thing I wanna point out about Bacillus cereus and Clostridium perfringes is the toxins they make um, are often heat labile, which means that by heating the food properly, then you kill or you denature that toxin and it won't make you sick. So it's in not cooking it enough that's problematic. But Staph aureus and some Bacillus cereus toxins are heat stable, meaning that even if you reheat the food, even if you refrigerated it and then you heated it, it doesn't denature the protein or the toxin, and so it still makes you sick, which is what happened with my quiche. I did reheat it in the microwave. It was nice and hot when I ate it, but it was probably some heat-stable toxin that was making me sick. Um, all right, so those are all causes of acute diarrhea. I told you this is going to be a long one. There's also things that can cause chronic diarrhea. These tend to be protozoan causes that cause the sort of like you know, diarrhea that lasts for weeks rather than for a couple of days. Um, there's non-infectious causes of chronic diarrhea. So it's not necessarily means that you have an infection. It could be that you have irritable bowel syndrome um, or something with your diet, something diet, like maybe you're lactose intolerant. Um, but there are also infectious causes. So they can be forms of E. coli, which I won't really talk about. We'll talk about these um, giardia and intamoeba, which are protozoans that just cause longer lasting diarrhea. Um, giardia and intamoeba both are water-borne protists. They're found in, you know, uh, untreated water like ponds and rivers and stuff. They generally come from animal um, intestinal tracts and you can drink them or potentially they could be contaminated on produce that had been washed in contaminated water, or you could get it from swimming in a sort of, like in a river or a lake or something and swallowing too much water. Um, you ingest what you ingest are the cysts that are the free living form in the water, and then they um, hatch and mature into these trophozoite stage in the intestines. And so this is a really common um, pathogen of animals, like it's commonly pass through animals in like wild animals in the environment. And they're the ones that poop out the cysts that get into the water. But if you drink them, then those trophozoites, the feeding stage, um, they have these little suckers um, and that allows them to sort of suction onto the intestinal lining. And then they can cause intestinal damage and but they cause a lot of cramping and diarrhea that's more prolonged. Um, so sometimes it's harder, to, it's not as acute, it's not like you have like multiple diarrhea cases per day, it's not as severe, the diarrhea is not as runny, I suppose. And so sometimes people will have it for weeks before they actually get it diagnosed. There is treatment for it, there are antibiotic or antiprotozoals that you can take um, that will help it to go away. Um, same thing with Intamoeba histolytica. This one has a higher fatality rate, but again, um, it's gonna be more in people who are um, immunocompromised, are definitely much more susceptible to death from intamoeba infection. So again, same thing, you drink contaminated water that contains the cysts, the cysts hatch and mature into trophozoites, the feeding stage, 
in the intestines. They can um, cause erosion of the intestinal lining. Um, they can lead to so that can lead to bleeding and dysentery, bleeding intestines, bleeding diarrhea. So it's more intense disease of the intestines um, because they're actually invading the tissue, the intestinal tissue. They can also spread to other parts of the body, infect the liver, spleen, other sort of accessory organs near the intestines. So um, that one's a little bit more serious. It is treatable though with um, different anti-protozoal uh, antibiotics. Um, and also, again, rehydration therapy is important. Treating water. So treating water really will help you prevent both of these types of protozoan. If you're hiking, make sure that you are either boiling water, that you bring fresh water, or that you boil water if you're like on a multi-day camping trip. Um, they also sell like iodine tablets. There's different like treatment tablets that you can throw into a water bottle so you can fill it from the stream and then throw in this iodine tablet that will kill Giardia and Entamoeba. Um, so they're, they're fairly susceptible. They're easy to kill. Just the key is not drinking these contaminated water sources. Um, all right, so now we're moving away from diarrhea, which was a majority of the chapter. Lots of different organisms that can cause diarrhea. Now we're going to look at things that can infect the stomach. So remember the stomach is full of acid and so it's really an, a very hostile environment for microbes, so you don't get a lot of gastritis infections. But one that's really common, there are some viruses that can cause gastritis, and those, of course, um, food, food poisoning can cause um, inflammation of the stomach that causes a lot of vomiting, because that's a toxin. Um, but a bacteria that has learned to really live and thrive in the stomach, that's a halophile, or sorry, a acidophile, is this one here called Helicobacter pylori. It looks like this, it's a rod with flagella. And um, it is can be a normal flora. It can be, people can be a carrier of this where it doesn't cause any disruption. Um, but what it can do is it can disrupt that mucus lining of the stomach. So the stomach is surrounded in this sort of mucus protective layer that prevents the stomach from being digested by its own gastric juice and so with um, but with helicobacter pylori it can sort of eat away at that mucus layer and then the gastric the acid and the pepsin start actually eroding and causing an ulcer in the stomach itself so it's basically like a lesion or a wound that's caused by like the caustic contents of the stomach um, and so we call these gastric ulcers and if they form down here in the lower part of the stomach, they're called peptic ulcers. Um, and they cause bleeding because the tissue is now exposed. So there's bleeding in the stomach. There's definitely pain, um, chronic pain. And it can even cause, the lesion can actually go through the entire stomach and cause perforation of the stomach, which is really the most dangerous outcome. And so um, it was a long time thought that it was just from stress or spicy food. They didn't know until the 1980s that it was caused by this bacteria. And the, the people who found it, um, Robin Warren and Barry Marshall are Australian scientists. They had one of those crazy stories where they, you know, they just did a study. They looked at people with ulcers and people without ulcers and they cultured different bacteria in their intestines. They found this correlation between the presence of helicobacter and ulcers and they published it and everyone was like great that's like a really strong correlation but it doesn't prove cause and effect and so then they decided to just drink the tubes of helicobacter themselves give themselves ulcers and then treat it with antibiotics and i don't think they won the nobel prize for doing that per se but they did win the nobel prize for discovering that connection and the cause and effect of helicobacter and ulcers. And the wonderful thing about it was, is that because it's caused by a bacteria that's treatable with antibiotics, we now had a treatment for gastric ulcers where there previously was none. The treatment was usually rest and avoid spicy foods, which didn't always help. So now we can treat them with antibiotics. Um, so some of the ways that it causes disease, it bores, it physically moves through that mucus layer and disrupts that mucus protective layer, which exposes the epithelial lining to gastric juice. Um, and what it's 
fairly prevalent because it's present in a large portion of the population. They don't all develop ulcers, but anyone who has Helicobacter pylori is at risk of developing ulcers. Um, the thing too is that Helicobacter, that having ulcers actually increases your risk of stomach cancer. But for some reason, having Helicobacter pylori also decreases the risk of esophageal cancer. So that's just a correlation that they found. Um, the treatment will be antibiotics, but also the other treatment that existed before was antacids. Trying to reduce stomach acid would reduce that, the ulcer, and, um, and make it less severe. Um, an infection of the liver is known as hepatitis. Hepato means liver. And there are several viruses that can cause hepatitis. There's a family of them. So there's different, there's different letters. There's hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hep C, D, and E. There's five of them. There's also um, cytomegalovirus can cause hepatitis and Epstein-Barr virus, which causes mono, can also lead to hepatitis, um, but less so than the hepatitis viruses, which are the ones we're going to focus on. So they're named hepatitis virus because the disease they cause is inflammation of the liver. So this is just a picture of healthy liver versus inflamed liver, or actually this is cirrhotic liver. So there are some, so if the, the liver is actually very, it's very hardy and it can, and it can heal itself to some extent, but there's a limit to how much healing and repairing it can do. And so when it does repair itself, like the skin can repair itself, when you get a cut and it repairs, it forms this scar tissue. So same thing happens in the liver. So if you have a whole bunch of liver damage and a whole bunch of scar tissue, the scar tissue just isn't as good as healthy tissue. And so over time, after a, when the liver has been damaged a lot over time, it becomes cirrhotic and it just full of this scar tissue and doesn't work as well, basically. Um, another sign of liver damage is jaundice. So you can see sort of the healthy pink coloring of the skin over here. And then on the right, the very yellow coloring of the skin. One of the jobs of the liver is to um, process bilirubin when your blood, you know, your red blood cells only live, they have a short life, life cycle. They only live for a few weeks and then they die. And you make, you're constantly making more red blood cells and constantly recycling the old and dying red blood cells. And it's the job of the liver to process one of those, the substances of dying red blood cells called bilirubin. And it happens to have a, a yellow color. And so when the bilirubin builds up from the failure of the liver to process it, it builds up in the skin and causes this jaundice, this yellowing color. So that can be a sign of liver disease that's very um, easy to see just looking at someone. So the the hepatitis viruses, the three most important ones are hep A, hep B, and hep C. And they're actually very different looking viruses. They're just in the same family because of the disease they cause, hepatitis. So hep A and hep B, I have these asterisks next to them because they are vaccine preventable. There are vaccines for them. Hep B is actually given at birth, um, very young. Um, and hep A is, as you can see, a very different looking virus. It's non-enveloped, where hep B and hep C are enveloped. Hepatitis A has a very different transmission. So hepatitis A is actually a, an oral virus. It causes foodborne illness, but it can also cause hep inflammation of the liver. So you actually get it from eating contaminated food, and there's little outbreaks, foodborne outbreaks of it. So it's something that's particularly um, dangerous from eating food. So it's another thing that um, pregnant women have to watch out for. Um, but there is a vaccine for it. It's not particularly common in the US, hep A. Um, and it's again, you get it from eating like you'll sometimes there will be outbreaks in different restaurants um, from serving food that is contaminated. It used to not be on the list for common vaccinations in the US. It was really only like if you were traveling, but it's becoming more prevalent, um, again, with just how we, you know, serve food and manufacture food en masse. And so I know my pediatrician um, recommended it for my kids 
in their early teens or late, you know, maybe like when they were like 10. Um, so it is something that's becoming more common to vaccinate everyone for. Hep B, totally standard on the childhood vaccination schedule. Um, Hep B is ca causes a chronic infection of the liver and can it can also be oncogenic. It can lead to liver cancer. And so, um, and the disease is much worse in if infants, if you catch it during infancy versus if you catch it later in life, which is why it's on the schedule for infants to be vaccinated. Um, it is, can be transmitted um, through the, like basically bloodborne, it's a bloodborne disease. So it can be transmitted vertically from mother to infant, which is why it's given at birth. It can also be transmitted sexually. It can be transmitted through needles, blood contamination. Um, and a lot of cases, a lot of kids who show up with Hep B, the cause of infection is unknown. Like they don't know how they got exposed. So it's it's fairly contagious, Hepatitis B. Um, so it's really important to get the vaccine for that. Hepatitis C, we still don't have a vaccine for, and it causes chronic liver infection and is also very oncogenic, can lead to liver cancer. Um, and it also is bloodborne, but again, we don't have a vaccine for it. There is now um, some treatment for it. There are some antivirals that are working really well for Hep B and C, um, but since there's no vaccine for hepatitis C, it's still a really big concern. And it's called the Hep C, the, there's actually a lot of Americans that it's very common disease, hepatitis. Um, Four million Americans are infected with it. It's called the silent epidemic because it doesn't make you acutely ill. You don't get like severe illness. It's sort of silently infects the liver and causes damage that the liver repairs until the liver is so damaged that it's starting to fail or until you develop liver cancer. So it's sort of a, it's sort of quietly asymptomatic until the damage is so bad that it actually causes disease. So um, it's uh, the most common cause of liver transplants in the US is hep C infection. Um, and it's also a fairly common cause of liver cancer. So hepatitis C, we're still working on a vaccine for that one. Um, falling rates of hepatitis B vaccination are increasing the number of cases of hepatitis B, but it is preventable. So we really got to work on vaccination for that. And luckily we do have the development fairly recently of some um, hepatitis antivirals that are helping to keep that disease at bay. But again, only if it, they're most um, successful if they're given early on in somebody who tests positive for hep C but before they're showing those really bad symptoms. And it can also prolong their um, time while they're waiting for a liver transplant. So there's, you know, just not enough livers to go around to 4 million people who are infected. So the antivirals can help reduce the burden of disease and also buy them time for a liver transplant. Um, and now for the helmets. And even if you're tired of listening to me, you might need to pause this. I'm getting a little tired of talking, but I'm getting jazzed now that I get to the helmets because helmets are so weird and gross, but they're real. They just sound like science fiction, but they're not. And I think that's what I like about them. Um, I just can't believe that they're real. So they can be very diverse. Of course, remember we have different types of helmets. There are the round worms, and then there are the flat worms, and there's two types of flat worms, the tapeworms, which are cestodes, and the flukes, which we call trematodes. Um, and all of those can cause disease of the GI tract. They can be very large as adults, and so it's sort of weird that we call them microbes, but the reason we do is because they have life stages. The egg stage is microscopic. And so they're, the stage that infects you is usually that egg stage. And the stage that infects you is microscopic. So that's why we still classify them as microbes because the life cycles, there, there are stages of the life cycle that are microscopic, even if they can grow very, very large and be very macroscopic. Um, so some, some classic things about helminth diseases, they tend to be chronic and not acute. 
and um, they tend to also involve symptoms that are from the host's immune system and not from the helminth itself. So let's talk about a couple. Oh, some other things that are very classic signs of helminth infections. The type of white blood cell that's really prominent in, in fighting helminths are eosinophils. So T cells and B cells, remember B cells make antibodies, which are really good at immobilizing microbes like bacteria and viruses, but don't really do much in terms of um, immobilizing a worm. Okay, a tapeworm cannot be swallowed by a phagocyte. It is not very effectively attacked by antibodies and T cells also are not very effective. So it's a totally different type of immune response that we get with um, helminths and we won't get totally into it, but one really easy way to distinguish them immunologically is that eosinophils play a big role. So eosinophils secrete a bunch of enzymes and um, cytokines that can help to attack helminths. So one of the things that we see in someone with a helminth infection that you can sometimes diagnose it just based on the blood test is you get eosinophilia, an increase of eosinophils. So if you remember from the white blood cell count, eosinophils were very rare. You, you maybe found like a couple of them in your blood counts, or you should have only found a couple of them. Because um, in healthy people, they're, they're, they're very low counts, but someone with a, with a helminth infection is gonna have much higher counts of eosinophils. So it's really a hallmark of helminth infection. Helminth infections are often acquired through the fecal oral route, so eating something that's been contaminated with eggs. But there are several that can actually get in through skin penetration that we'll talk about. So there's a couple of different ways that it can get in. And um, a lot of them do localize to the intestines or have some part of their life cycle in the intestines, which is why we're spending most of our time on helminths in this chapter on the gastrointestinal system. Not all of the symptoms though, or the disease occur in the gastrointestinal system. So the, the different life cycles, they really can vary. And a lot of times they are multi-host or multiple stages. So you have some where you um, ingest the egg and then the egg goes to the intestines and it hatches and forms the adults. And that's pretty simple, cycle A. All right, in this cycle, cycle B, they, um, they invade through the skin, the portal of entry through the skin. So there are some that live in soil and they'll actually just burrow into your bare feet if you're walking around barefooted in the soil. And then they will travel to the intestines where then they will uh, stay and um, produce eggs. And then the eggs are pooped out into the environment and they hatch in the environment and form these larvae that are infective that burrow through your skin and the life cycle continues. We'll talk about like with tapeworms, they are ones that have a two host life cycle. So they infect like cows or pigs and then um, form cysts in the muscle and you eat the meat that's been undercooked and those cysts hatch in the intestines and form adult tapeworms in the intestines. And then you poop out the eggs and it goes and the eggs go into the grass, and then the grass is eaten by the cow, and the life cycle continues. And then this is a, a weirder one, one where um, it infects through um, another organ, and um, and actually, I'm not even going to go through this one. This is like so, like schistosoma, for example, where like the um, in schistosomes, they infect through the skin, but they ultimately go to the intestine, and then you release the eggs, and the eggs form something else, or maybe, I don't know, there's, this is like trying to put multiple life cycles in one, so let's ignore that. Okay, so things that helminths have that give them virulence factors that allow them to cause disease. They all will have some kind of specialized attachment feature, usually mouth parts like little hooks or suckers that allow them to attach to tissues. They also will secrete enzymes that help them to digest um, or penetrate tissues. They are large and often have like 
hard layers that help them from host that protect them from host defenses and um, they often will have multi-host life cycles so they may have a definitive host which is where they reproduce and humans are oftentimes a definitive host but sometimes we're an intermediate host we, they're just passing through us to get to their definitive host um, but usually humans are the definitive host where the adult worm is found so to diagnose a helminth infection um, one sign is that's helpful and fairly not very invasive is to do a blood test and look for eosinophilia you may also do a stool test and look for eggs or larvae or adult worms in the stool um, so sometimes this is possible and sometimes it's not some things don't um, like you you just can't find them in, in the stool um, you can also do serological tests. So even though antibodies are not particularly effective against helminths, they will still be made against helminths and sometimes can be effective at preventing, like if you get infected in those early stages when the helminth is still very small, those antibodies can be helpful. So you can test for antibodies to look for infection um, because there's not really a good test to look for worms in the intestines like doing an endoscopy or something like that is not usually standard. So you can prevent um, helminth infections through hygienic practices, but there are no vaccines for any helminth infections. And there are medications, so you can treat helminth infections usually with some kind of anti-helminthic. And in the US, we have good access to those. We have, helminth infections are rare and access to those anti-helminthics is very easy to get. But in developing countries where helminth infections are very common and access to drugs is not very good, it's much more problematic. Also, there is really no natural immunity to any helminth infections, so you can get reinfected over and over again. So even in countries, so in countries where helminth infections are common, even if you get access to drugs, you treat the infection, but then you can go out and get it again. So, um, uh, some of my favorite helminth infections, pinworms, which are still very small. So this is a ruler with, I think these are inches. So they're, they're very small, like maybe a half an inch long, but they're still visible. Just You could still see them with the naked eye. This is just a regular camera taking this picture. Tapeworms can be very, very large and they can be several meters long. Um, but the individual pieces actually fall off. And these are like the eggs. They're called proglottids of the tapeworms. And you poop those out so they can be found in the poop. Um, pinworms, one of my favorite infections, very common in kids, but can also happen in adults. These are worms that are just like they live in the soil and they lay eggs. And then kids play in the dirt and they don't wash their hands and they put their hands in their mouth and they swallow the eggs. And then the eggs hatch in the intestines and the adult worms live in the intestines and mate. And then the mommy worms come out of the butt at night and they lay eggs around the anus, around the anal opening. And they stick the eggs there with their saliva. And then the saliva dries and it makes the butt really itchy. And so then the kid itches their butt and then they get eggs on their hands and they play with toys and other kids touch the toys and then put their hands in their mouth and so on and so forth. <clears throat> it really doesn't cause much discomfort besides the butt itching. And that's usually the sign that tells you that a kid has pinworm. It doesn't really cause any cramping. It doesn't cause chronic disease. It's really the main symptom is the itchy butt. Um, and it's very treatable with anti-helminthics. So that hallmark symptom is the itchy anus and you can actually do this tape test where you put a piece of tape on the butt and you and you look at it under a microscope to look for the eggs. You can even use a flashlight at night because the worms come out at night to look for the worms at night, which is really gross if you've ever done that. I haven't, but my aunt did with my cousin when he was little. That's how she found out. Um, whipworm is something that you can get in tropical regions. Um, and it infects the intestines and it can actually hook into the intestines and cause intestinal bleeding, which leads, which of course we call dysentery. 
It can also cause rectal prolapse, which is this lovely picture here on the right. This is someone who um, is basically, when they poop, they poop out their rectum. The rectum comes out. And, um, and it can be fatal it can, and, and difficult to treat and repair. Um, a lot of helminths will enter the body in the larval or egg stage. So you don't get a helminth infected by eating like a large tapeworm, right? You would never do that. You would be disgusted if you saw actual worms in your food. So the stages that infect us are the, mi the microscopic stages, the larva or the eggs. And then they usually mature into the adult stage in the intestines. They may circulate and actually burrow and find their way into other parts of the body from the intestines. Um, there are some that will actually migrate to the respiratory system and then you cough them up and swallow them and that's how they get into the intestines. Um, and then they actually, so they may actually hatch in the intestine and then migrate to the blood or to the respiratory system and then get back to the intestinal system. So some of them have these really strange migratory pathways and may cause symptoms in, during that migration. So there are some that go into the respiratory tract, they go into the lungs, and then you end up coughing them up and swallowing them down. You don't feel them. And, and so you have this little cough. You might have to develop a cough that was actually related to your worm infection. Um, uh, so tapeworm is the other one I always like to feature. So tapeworm is also known as sister cirrhosis, and you in inject the, or sorry, you ingest, you eat the eggs, these little proglottids, these little pieces that break off um, are called proglottids, and you consume them in, uh, oh no, sorry, you don't consume them, an animal consumes them. So I should say, I should correct this. Humans are infected by eating animal flesh that does not, that contains worm eggs, that contains worm cysts. So it's usually animals like a cow or a pig that ingest the proglottids. And then the proglottids hatch into cysts and form cysts in the muscles of those animals. And then you eat the muscle, that's what meat is. And those cysts hatch and they grow into these large tapeworms in your body. The danger is if humans eat these proglottids, because if humans eat these proglottids, then they can, so here's the picture of the life cycle, all right? Usually animals eat the proglottids, we eat the muscle tissue that contains the cysts, and the cysts hatch in the intestines. If we eat the proglottids, all right, then they can hatch in our bodies and cause this condition here called neurosister cirrhosis, where they hatch in the body and they're like thinking it's a pig or a cow and they need to look for the muscle tissue, but we're not pigs and cows. And so they get lost looking for the muscle tissue and end up in the brain and they form cysts in the human brain. And this is untreatable. So you can't, the cysts don't grow. Um, they sort of stay there permanently, but they can affect the functioning of the brain and especially if you have multiple ones and usually people present when they start having neurological symptoms and they get a cat scan and then they realize oh my god you have tapeworm and you've been reinfecting yourself for years and then they'll treat the tapeworm so they can get rid of the tapeworm infection in the intestines but there's nothing they can do about the neurosis or cirrhosis um so it's uh kind of can be a silent infection the tapeworm itself in the intestines can have very mild symptoms that get that don't get recognized until you start having neurological symptoms that take you to the doctor and then they realize oh you that trip you took 10 years ago to whatever country you probably picked up a tapeworm and you've had it and been reinfecting yourself so definitely be careful you know when you travel and then um, my my pet one schistosomiasis this was the one I studied in grad school. Schistosomes are dimorphic. So there's a male worm and then the female worm, that's her head. She lives in this groove on the front of the male worm. He basically wraps around her. I like to think of it like a banana, like the, the female is the banana fruit and the male is the banana peel. And But sometimes the female will stick her head out. They basically mate 24 seven and the female just lays eggs. Like she's just like a, an egg laying factory.
So the way that they get in, um, so they have a two host life cycle, humans and snails. So somebody who's infected, um, they poop out eggs, the eggs get into a water system, and they hatch into this infectious larva that will infect snails in the water. And then out of the snails come this um, new larval stage called the cercaria, which looks, I say it's, a, I call it the mermaid sperm stage because it has a forked tail like a mermaid, but it also kind of looks like a sperm because it's just like head and tail. And it's this cercaria that will swim like a little, like a little sperm and actually burrow through your skin. So if you're swimming around in the water, it burrows through the skin and then the tail pops off and the head becomes the new stage that actually will go into the blood system and swim through the blood, actually go through the lungs, it does some weird stuff, but ultimately ends up in the blood vessels around the intestines. So it's not in the intestines itself, it's in the blood vessels around the intestines. And the female lays a bunch of eggs and the eggs get pushed through the blood vessel walls into the intestines and so then you poop out the eggs. So the eggs do come out of the intestinal system, even though the worms are located in the blood vessels. Not all of the eggs get pushed into the intestines. Some of them get swept up in the blood flow, like the river, the current of your blood, and they get swept into the liver. And so a bunch of eggs getting swept into the liver, you know, for a few days, not a big deal. A couple of years, maybe not a big deal, but over time, those eggs build up and cause cumulative damage of the liver. So again, this one can be asymptomatic. You don't know you have it, you don't really have any symptoms until your liver starts to fail. So, and it can be problematic in countries where these snails are endemic. So you only find schistosomiasis where you find the correct snails, snail hosts, and those tend to be in tropical regions, so not in the US. Um, you can ha be infected for a very long time. They cause these chronic infections that are often asymptomatic. And those eggs that get swept in, up into the liver, they form these granulomas. So basically what happens in the liver is the liver gets inflamed and it forms these, these walls, the sort of scar tissue around the egg. And one or two eggs, that's not a big deal, but when you get thousands and thousands or millions of eggs over years and years, then this, the whole liver starts to become full of these granulomas, these scarred areas. And so the, you get a lot of um, enlargement of the liver, hepatomegaly, and you might get splenomegaly because it's white blood cells that actually make these walled off areas. Um, occasionally you can get weird things like the eggs getting carried off past the liver into the central nervous system or the heart. Um, so schistosoma only exists where those snails are in tropical areas, equatorial regions where you find those species of snails in the water. And um, so the best thing to do is not go swimming in those areas where schistosomiasis is endemic. Just avoid bodies of water where you can get schistosomiasis. But it is a really, it does have a very high morbidity over 200 million people in the world are infected with schistosomiasis. They may not be suffering yet from the disease, but they have it. And a lot of them are suffering. They're sick. They have liver disease, but they may not be dying. It's a sort of slow death from it because it's a chronic disease. So it's a neglected tropical disease. It doesn't get a ton of funding research because it doesn't cause a lot of death. That doesn't mean it doesn't cause a lot of disease and a lot of illness and people who can't work because they're sick because they their livers are failing. Um, and then I guess part of the the last part of the chapter deals with some bacteria in the mouth uh, and diseases of the oral microbiota. So well, we'll talk about cavities basically. So the mouth is part of the gastrointestinal tract and the teeth are important for eating. And one of the diseases of the teeth are cavities. So there's a lot of bacteria in your mouth that are normal, they're there, they're helpful, um, but they can also form biofilms on the surface of your teeth. And that's what this diagram is here, of a biofilm of just multiple different types of bacteria forming on the surface of the teeth. Um, and they tend, researchers have found they tend to form in very systematic ways. 
So these, these streptococcal species down here in blue tend to form the first layer, and then all these other bacteria will sort of stick to them. So it's these streptococcal species that are closest to the surface of the teeth and that are most responsible for the formation of these biofilms and for the potential cavity uh, formation that occurs. So what is tooth decay? So your teeth are made up, they have this hard enamel on the surface that protects the soft tissue underneath. And this here is the tooth root, which has nerve endings in it. Okay, so this hard enamel is protective, um, but if it gets eroded away, then bacteria can get into the actual tooth and cause infections of the tooth. And so we call these cavities or dental caries. And um, that's what you go to the dentist to have them look for and help you prevent by in your, you brush your teeth to prevent these cavities from forming. But if you do get a cavity like, and so if you have a cavity like this, that's when they'll do a filling. So they'll fill this, they'll remove the bacteria and they'll fill it with something to reinforce that enamel. But if the cavity gets deeper than that, then they may have to do a root canal and actually, or actually remove the whole tooth or drill out the whole tooth and fill the whole thing. Um, because otherwise bacteria has, has access to your nerves and into your gums and that's not good. So the Cav the cavity, the bacteria that are most commonly problematic for bacteria are the strep mutans, those streptococcal species that grow on the surface of the teeth. And there's also maybe some lactobacilli that they think are really big contributors as well. So here's the surface of your tooth, here's the enamel, here's the dentin underneath, and here's the biofilm of bacteria on it. So you can see there's a lot of streptococci and also maybe some actinomyces in this picture and some lactobacilli. And so you can see they kind of form in this, um, so they form this biofilm and then they are, meta so when you eat food, they eat that food as well, um, particularly sugars. And what have we seen in lab when bacteria get into contact with sugars? They ferment them. And a common product of fermentation is acid. And so it's not that the bacteria are eating the enamel of your tooth, it's that the bacteria eat the sugar in your mouth and they produce acid and the acid builds up and the acid erodes the enamel. So it's not so much the bacteria that cause the cavities, it's the bacteria plus your diet. So if you didn't eat any sugar, those bacteria probably wouldn't cause any cavities. It's the combination of the bacteria and sugar in the diet that cause the cavities. So um, diet is really important in combination with those bacteria. So the two ways, I guess, to prevent cavities are to restrict sugar, um, which is what those bacteria turn into acid, which becomes cavities, and also to regularly remove the bacteria and the acid through regular flossing and brushing and drinking fluids that don't have sugar. Um, even gum can help to remove those bacteria and produce a lot of extra saliva, which helps to wash away the acid that's being produced. So all of those things help to prevent cavities. So that's what your dentist will always tell you when they go in, make sure you're brushing your teeth twi at least twice a day and that you are reducing the amount of sugar especially stuff that you are drinking or like candies that you're sucking. And so you just have like, you know, you're just bathing your teeth in sugar. And if you do eat sugar, brush your teeth afterwards to remove it from your, and to remove the bacteria so they don't produce those acids. Um, you can also get deeper disease in the mouth, so into the gums. Periodontal disease is disease uh, like not just on the surface of the tooth, but deeper either into the gums, that's gingivitis or into like the bones of the teeth, that's periodontitis. And so again, brush, floss, remove those bacteria and reduce sugar in order to reduce that disease. Because as we, if you remember, um, we talked about how when bacteria get, so this is just showing you like the gums, healthy gums are pressed right up against the tooth. But when they become inflamed from bacteria, 
um, they start to move away from the tooth and pull away from the tooth. And then that also just allows more bacteria in. Um, so the treatment, of course, for this is going to be removal of the buildup on the teeth. So you might have surgery, you might have teeth removed, you might have, there's some gum surgery where they, I don't know how they do it, but they can like add to your gums and maybe, maybe take some from one part and add more tissue there. Um, uh, so those are diseases that, so remember those streptococcal disease, the streptococcal bacteria, they can also get into the blood through the gums and cause endocarditis. We, we said that chronic endocarditis can be, and cardiovascular disease might be due to oral health and those streptococcal species in the mouth. So good oral health protects you from cavities and it makes you have a nice smile and good teeth, but also can make your cardiovascular system healthy or prevent disease there. And then the, I think this is the last disease in the chapter is mumps. And mumps is a virus. It's part of the MMR vaccine. We do have a vaccine against it. It's pretty rare. It causes um, infection of the salivary gland. So you get this real big swelling of the, sal the um, sublingual or um, sal salivary glands here. And it just causes this massive swelling. So when my daughter had she had that infection of her lymph node. At first I thought, does she have mumps? Because that's what she looked like. Her face looked like this. Um, but it was not her salivary gland that was inflamed. It was actually her lymph node. Um, and so you get this real big swelling. What, some of the complications of mumps is that it can actually lead to sterilization. It can, or no, sorry, not sterilization. It can lead to inflammation of the testes in males, which actually doesn't usually result in sterilization. Um, but can be very, very painful. And it, I don't, I'm not even sure that it was really all that deadly when it was prominent, but it was easy to design a vaccine towards. And so we have one. And um, so it's part of the MMR vaccine. It's not particularly contagious. Mumps outbreaks are very rare. We still have measles and pertussis, or sorry, pertussis isn't part of that vaccine. Measles, mumps, and rubella. We still get measles outbreaks. Rubella is also fairly contagious, so we still will sometimes have cases of that. But mumps, I think, is pretty, pretty uh, almost eliminated. Um, so I won't spend uh, much time on it because it's not really a huge problem in the healthcare industry. But it is if you see a kid with really swollen uh, neck or cheek like that, then mumps is something that should be part of the differential, one of the diagnoses that you consider. If they've had the MMR vaccine, it's very unlikely that they have mumps. Um, but if they haven't, it is, it's a possibility. But it also, like in my daughter's case, what happened to just be an infection of the lymph node. But certainly mumps was something that the doctor considered and then ruled out pretty quickly since she is vaccinated and also didn't have some of the other symptoms. So that is the end now of chapter 20, and I will shut up.